issues uh, on having these probabilities and academic stability from day to day. Uh, well, thank you very much, Diana, and thank you also to Michna and to Patrizio and to Grigori uh, for making my stay possible. I'm very happy to be back in Bucharest after, after five years. Uh, so thank you to, for giving me the possibility to um, uh, test this uh, paper of mine in front of you. Uh, maybe not everyone here is very familiar with Gassani, so I'm just going to uh, say a few words about who is this uh, Pierre Gassandi, uh, philosopher, a uh, French philosopher of the first century, uh, of the first part of the 17th century, <laughs> not the first century. Um, well, it's an interesting figure, or I hope to show you that tonight, because uh, what's funny with Gassandi is that he's as little read as he has aroused so very divergent interpretations. Uh, when I say that uh, is very little read, I guess that very few among you in that room has ever read, okay, let's not say a line, but a full page of Gassandi. <laughs> oh, okay, one. <laughs> uh, well, and this is mainly due to the fact that Gassandi is a bit seen as an antiquarian. You know the type of philosopher who tried to revive uh, ancient sources like Epicureanism, but many others. And the other main reason is that he wrote in a very terse, difficult Latin. So for poor scholars that we are in the 21st century, it makes our life difficult. Um, but I guess even if you have never read uh, a page of Gassandi, you must have heard the name because uh, Gassandi is mainly known uh, first as a big opponent to Descartes. So he wrote the uh, fifth objection to Descartes' meditations. And he's also known so to be a promoter of the revival of Epicureanism in the 17th century. And as such also because he was a promoter of atomism and because he was a big supporter of uh, Galilean science, he can be seen as a founding father of the new science of the 17th century. And what is also important is that I would say at least up to the end of the 17th century, he was really seen as an equal and very serious rival to Descartes. So as important as Descartes. Um, and so at the time, he was not perceived as a second-rate author, but really as a major figure. So you see me coming. <laughs> My underground aim being to try to uh, give back uh, to Gassandi his philosophical due, because I think he has been a bit uh, eclipsed by figures like this. Um, but if one looks at the scholarship on Gassandi, and I have to say it's not so abundant, but there is some scholarship on Gassandi, what is very funny is that you have these very divergent interpretations. And on one hand, you have Gassandi emerging as a kind of libertine, materialist, almost crypto ethicist And this is a kind of interpretation um, put forward, for example, by uh, someone like René Pintard, who published a book in 1943 called, uh, entitled Le Libertinage Érudit dans la première moitié du XVIIe siècle. And I would say at the opposite end of the spectrum of interpretations, you have uh, scholars like um, Margaret Osler, who published her uh, uh, Di uh, Div Divine Will and the Mechanical Philosophy, Gassandi and Descartes on Contingency and Necessity in the Creative World in 1994, which, on the contrary, presents Gassandi as a philosopher putting much emphasis uh, on kind of what she calls a voluntary theology, so the importance of God uh, in creation, of God's will in creation and uh, the consequent contingency of human knowledge that would result from this um, voluntary theology. So you see, on one hand, kind of almost crypto ethics, on the, and on the other hand, someone obsessed by God's will. Okay. <laughs> and so, I hope you see from what I've just said that Gassani can be very instrumental in uh, the historiography of the early modern philosophy. 
And actually, the starting point of my talk is another in instrumental approach to get something, namely uh, Richard Popkin's theory <coughs> of skepticism uh, from Erasmus to Descartes, that was the first edition, then the second was from Erasmus to Spinoza, and the third and final one from uh, Savonarola to Bay. So I'll start with this um, interpretation, which I uh, consider to be instrumental. And I'm going to explain to you why, and um, as you can guess, the end of that talk will be to undermine this kind of instrumental interpretation. So in this uh, history of skepticism from Erasmus to Descartes, Richard Popkin claimed the importance of what he calls in French crise pironienne, pironienne crisis, <coughs> or the constitution of philosophical modernity. Popkin saw this philosophical crisis as a sequel to the religious crisis that arose from the Protestant Reformation. And it was, according to Popkin, nourished by the simultaneous rediscovery of the works of Sextus and Pericus. And this led Popkin to considerably downplay the role of another type of ancient dogmatic philosophy, namely academic skepticism in the forging of early modern philosophy. So let me just remind you the difference between so Sextus and Pericus as Pyrrhonian philosopher on one hand, and uh, what is called academic skepticism, academic philosophy on the other. Uh, academic philosophy was born in the context of the academy founded by Plato, and uh, among his followers, so mainly Archesilaus and Carneades, on the basis of the Socratic claim that you must know, all that I know is that I know nothing. On a theoretical level, and I'm going to concentrate on that theoretical level in that talk, uh, academic skeptics claim that a certain knowledge of things was impossible, so it's not possible to gain certain knowledge of things, but uh, that at least according to Carnegie's, it's, it's possible for them to reach what they call a probable knowledge of sense. And they use the word in Greek, pitano, to designate this probable knowledge. And they also considered so, that there were some degrees of probabilities, uh, depending on the type of confirmation that could be gained through experience. And these ideas were diffused mainly by Cicero, Augustine, and Virginie Slayer. Pyrrhonians, on the other hand, even refused to claim that it was impossible to gain certain knowledge because it was already a claim, a statement. They didn't even want to claim that. Um, and what they advocated was a suspension of judgment and a kind of uninterrupted quest for truth. So we don't even know whether certain knowledge is possible. So we have to sus uh, suspend our essence as long as we don't have, uh, as long as we don't have, haven't reached something true, and this uh, should lead us to this uninterrupted quest for truth. Doesn't mean that we will reach truth one day, but at least we should try. And so this type of skepticism was mainly diffused by uh, the works of Sextus and Pericus I've already mentioned. Now, uh, Popkin attributed a crucial role together with Martin Mersen, whom you've maybe uh, already heard, because he also linked to Descartes. He attributed also a crucial role to Pierre Gesson in this uh, reconstruction of the role of Pyrrhonism in the verse of early modern philosophy. Because for Popkin, Gesson's philosophy was emblematic of one of two types of response to the skeptical fideism induced by the Pyrrhonian crisis. And the other type of response was mainly kind of dogmatic philosophy uh, and uh, you know, kind of, uh, philosophy elaborated by Descartes. And what is uh, particularly interesting for Popkin in his reconstruction of uh, the verse of early modern philosophy as a kind of reaction to this Pyrrhonian crisis is that Gassandi replicated at the scale of the individual philosopher what Popkin saw to have happened in, by the end of the 16th century and in the first half of the 17th century. What do I mean? I mean that 
uh, for Pocking, Gassani first went through a kind of Pyrrhonian crisis and then he tried to react to it by uh, elaborating a kind of philosophy which Hopkins calls mitigated skepticism. And this reaction was not really meant to solve the Pyrrhonian crisis, but rather to go around it uh, and to propose a kind of knowledge that would be limited in, ex in its extension and, and in its certainty. Um, so, this led Popkin to identify in Gassandi two moments. The first one being a Pyrrhonian moment, and the second one, so this mitigated skepticism. And so, for Popkin, the first Pyrrhonian moment corresponded to an early work written by Gassandi, which was entitled The Exercitationes Paradoxicae Adversus Aristotelios. So the um, paradoxical dissertations against the Aristotelians, which uh, Gassani wrote uh, around 1624. And then um, Gassani would have elaborated this kind of constructive skepticism, which is to be found in a later work called the Syntagma Philosophicum, and which was published posthumously. So, you know, you have this philosopher split into two parts and actually in Popkin's book, in two chapters. So what I want to do, you understand, with my talk, is try to reunite the two chapters uh, from Popkin's book, and to challenge more generally Popkin's emphasis on Pyrrhonism for the birth of early modern philosophy. What I want to show is that academic philosophy, so the other type, ancient non-dogmatic philosophy as mentioned, offered to Gassandi actually very early in his career, so this is against Popkin, an alternative to the Pyrrhonian suspension of essence and a model of knowledge which, contrary to Pyrrhonism, opened the possibility of a probabilist natural philosophy. So, let me uh, make things clear. I do not want to deny that Gassandi used some types of Pyrrhonian arguments. He did use some Pyrrhonian arguments, mainly to rebuke the Aristotelian philosophy. But what I want to show is that this uh, use of Pyrrhonian arguments is, I found, rather superficial, mainly negative and polemical. And what is really uh, important, what is really formative as an influence for Gassan's own philosophy is uh, many things. All right, there's also, of course, Epicureanism, as I mentioned at the beginning, but also the other type of ancient skepticism that Popkin seems to completely forget. And I want to show that very early in uh, Gassani's career, this played a very important formative role. And what is important is also against Popkin that Yes, Sandy was perfectly aware of the difference between Pyrrhonism and academic philosophy. Um, and he clearly distinguished them because he equated Pyrrhonism with skepticism proper, and for him this was characterized by the suspension of essence. This is skepticism proper for Gassandi. And uh, academic philosophy for him so was not skepticism proper. I called it at the beginning academic skepticism. Sorry for guessing it, but let's call it academic philosophy. Um, so, in this talk, I uh, want to show how the academic probabilism was integrated into Gessani's epistemology in order to overcome the Pyrrhonian suspension of essence. But uh, what I also want to show is that beyond the role of academic philosophy on this theoretical level, uh, I want to show that Gassani's choice in favor of academic probabilism was linked not so much to general eth ethical concerns as to an ethical dimension which is imminent and specific to the practice of the natural philosophy. So, my talk will also be concerned 
with um, what is the status of probabilism, not only for life in general, but how <coughs> this ethical dimension was transferred into the practice of natural philosophy. So, yes, I did not get rid of this ethical dimension, but it did something else with that. So, I turn to the first part of my talk, um, which will be mainly um, uh, an attempt to um, show uh, how Gassandi um, interpreted um, academic philosophy, what, um, what this reveals not only for uh, how Gassandi saw the history of philosophy in general, but also what it tells us uh, from the point of view of his own philosophy. But let me start with uh, a remark on Popkin, because I might have given you the impression that I had got rid of Popkin a little bit too uh, quickly, but just to give you some elements. Um, Popkin claimed that Mersenne's and Gassin's mitigated skepticisms, I quote him, constitute a type of epistemological pluralism. Very well, that's what he wants to uh, that's what he wants to, to sustain. The problem is that the definition Popkin gave of mitigated skepticism actually, according to me, sounds much closer to academic philosophy. I quote Popkin. Another way of meeting the skeptical crisis was a formulation of a theory which could accept the full force of the skeptical attack on the possibility of human knowledge in the sense of necessary truths about the nature of reality, and yet allow for the possibility of knowledge in a lesser sense as convincing or probable truths about appearances. Here we go, probable. I'm on my way. Um, so I have to admit that Popkin mentioned in passing a likeness between this kind of skepticism and Carnegie's thought, but in his books he never attempted to support this claim by textual comparisons. So I would like precisely to establish that academic philosophy provided an important contribution to the elaboration of Gessner's own philosophy. And I would first start by identifying two neglected aspects of the presence of academic philosophy in Gessner's work. So the first concerns the mode of argumentation that Gessner employs so in this Exercitationis, his first uh, written uh, work. And the second uh, deals with the analysis of academic philosophy that Gessner provided as a historian of philosophy, and which enabled him to situate his own philosophy as a new middle way between the dogmatics and the skeptics within the history of philosophy. So I start with the first one. As I said, Gassoni made a huge uh, use of Pyrrhonian argument in this text of the Exercitationis, Paradoxicae, uh, Adversus, Aristoteles, for his first book, uh, whose first part was published in 1624. Um, to refute the Aristotelians, he mainly relied on Textus and Pericus arguments. He also used, uh, in a cumulative way, arguments coming from Cicero's Academica, so academic philosophy, uh, in particular uh, against Aristotle's or the Stoics dialectic. But there is a more specific way in which Cicero, as representative of academic philosophy, was of use to get some of his machinery against Aristotelian philosophy. In the, preface to, in the preface to this book, so the Exercitationis, Gessani reminded the reader of the procedure he had used when he taught Aristotelian philosophy to his students in Aix-en-Provence, in the south of France, a procedure that the Exercitationis precisely produced. So you have to know that Gessani very early had really no taste whatsoever for Aristotelian philosophy, but as everyone well, he had to earn his living, so he had a position in Aix-en-Provence, and what was he asked to do as a teacher in philosophy at the time? Well, to teach Aristotelian philosophy, that's what you were supposed to do. So poor Gessandi, he has to go through all the works of Aristotle, which he dislikes very much, but he has to do that. But he found a way, and the way was, okay, my course will be structured in two parts. The first part will be uh, the presentation of the Aristotelian philosophy. And the second part will be an examination of that Aristotelian philosophy. You can imagine that he was not very uh, gentle with 
with Aristotelian philosophy. So basically, the second part of the course was the massive destruction of all the Aristotelian arguments. That was the course on Aristotelian philosophy. <coughs> the very orthodox one, I must say. So what he does, so the, exist the Exercitationis is based on that course that he taught in Aix-en-Provence. But of course, when he decided to publish the book, he decided that we didn't need the first part. So he just removed the first part of Aristotelian philosophy, because everyone knows that. Of course, everyone is told that at the university. So the interesting part is the second part. All the arguments against Aristotle. And so, in the preface, so he, he explains what he uh, used to do with the students in Aix-en-Provence. And so the procedure was basically to uh, use what he called the pro et contra way of argumentation. So you present an argument in favor of a thesis, an argument against a thesis, an Aristotelian thesis, of course, preferably. And Okay, but what is more interesting is that he considers that this uh, way of argumentation is Aristotelian. Well, he, at least he traces it back to Aristotle. And the thing is that, and this is a quotation that you have on the slide, we're going to read it together, but that is the interesting thing is that in Aristotle, this pro et contra way of argumentation was mainly uh, conceived as a kind of rhetorical exercise. And so what Gasson does, maybe let's first read um, the, uh, the quotation. So in this way, my auditors, so his students, uh, were warned not to make rash pronouncements for the so that there is no proposition or opinion so thoroughly accepted or so attractive that its opposite cannot be shown equally probable or even in most cases more probable. And so it seemed to me wiser in this matter to imitate Aristotle more faithfully than his most dedicated followers do. But as Cicero testifies in his orator, and this is a quotation from Cicero, Aristotle trained his young students in their school exercises not to discuss subtly, subtly in the manner of philosophers, but with the richness of the rhetoricians, both for and against, so pro et contra, so that they could speak more elegantly and more richly. So what does Gessonli do here? He relies on Cicero, academic philosopher, and he interprets this pro and contra discussion not only as a rhetorical exercise, but which it was for Aristotle, but in epistemological terms as a way to balance opposite opinions which prove to be as probable as each other or even as a way to identify the most probable opinion. You see, or even in most cases, more probable. Sometimes you reach some kind of equivalent um, statements, but sometimes there are some more probable um, opinions. And what's important here, it's, it's not so much the legitimacy of this identification of a skeptical procedure consisting in balancing and neutralizing each opinion by an opposite one to Aristotle's rhetorical exercise, but the fact that this identification directly comes from Cicero, so from an academic philosopher. And indeed, in the Tusculan Disputations, uh, the Tusculan Disputations, Tusculan Disputations uh, Cicero had traced back this academic practice of inutramque partem, or throat contra argumentation to Socrates and Carneades, and he had associated the academics and the peripatetics in this practice. The aim of the procedure consisting, consisted in refuting dogmatic opinions and substituting to them probable statements, and it is precisely the one employed by Gessonli in this Exercitationis against the Aristotelians, and by Cicero in this uh, uh, academic dialogue against the Stoics. So, my first point is, as concerns not so much the content, but the way of reasoning in the existationis, Gassendi clearly claimed for himself an academic procedure and not a Pyrrhonian one. That's the first point. The second point, this is based um, on uh, having a look at how uh, Gassendi uh, viewed the place of academic philosophy in the history of philosophy. 
So I said it's really too restrictive to see Gassani only as an antiquarian, but one must admit that this was the way he elaborated his philosophy. Usually, he takes all the opinions available on a topic, he goes through them, and then he reaches his own conclusion. So for that matter, he had to be a historian of philosophy. And um, so in the same time as philosophical, he relied on Sextus Empiricus. So Sextus Empiricus is a Pyrrhonian philosopher, but Sextus also reported the opinions of the academic philosophers. So this is a very important source for us about academic philosophy. And uh, relying on Sextus, Gessani identified three main groups in the Greek schools of philosophy, namely the dogmatics, the ecataleptics, and the skeptics. So the skeptics are characterized by the suspension of Hassan, and this refers to Pyrrhonism. The acataleptics are actually uh, the academic philosophers, and what uh, Gassan then tries to do is to retrace the genesis of the different academies in the wake of the first academy created by Plato. And Gassan especially insisted on what distinguished Carniers for the founder of the third academy, it's called Academia Nova, from Archizileus, the founder of the second academy. Plato, first academy, Archizileus, second academy, then Carnelius, third academy. Uh, this is how he presents Carnelius. Carnelius is commonly recognized as the founder of the new or third academy because he tempered the manner of philosophizing of Archizileus by deciding that not some certainty, but some very similitude was discovered in the <coughs> So, Gassani really insists on um, the emergence in the history of philosophy, in the history of Greek philosophy, of this notion of prob probable very similitude. It's, it's difficult to translate, actually, but we'll come back to that later on. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let me have a look. Did I have it here? Uh, I think if I don't have the Latin here, that I can give it to you later. I think this is very similar to the actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite sure it is. Because this is my translation, if I remember well. So, yeah. But I, I can check if you want. Uh, but guess I also use, uses the word probabilis. So what was important for Gassani was to recognize this emergence of very similar, probable uh, in the history of philosophy, because precisely this is going to be crucial for his own epistemology. And further on in the syntagma, Gassani deals with the question of the criterion of truth. This is a central question for uh, skepticism, um, because, you know, all the principle of a skeptic philosophy is to say that there is no criterion of truth. We cannot have a criterion which will uh, help us determine whether this uh, statement is true or not. Uh, and any statement, actually. So, I guess I broadly distinguish between those who accepted the existence of such a criterion, so that was the dogmatics, and those who rejected it. And to the second group belong the skeptics, so that is to say for him, the Pyrrhonians. But also, Gassani added to that group the academics. <coughs> the academics. Because we're talking about the criterion of truth. All right? Not the criterion of trouble. Criterion of truth. And Gassani noted that Carnelius had not reintroduced this criterion of truth that Archizilius also had rejected. Precisely because Carnegie had never claimed to reach the truth, but only what was very similar, probably. Now, for the Pyrrhonians and the academics, the criterion of truth, if any, had indeed to be such that it excluded anything wrong and led to infallibility, so that assent could be given in a firm way and without any fear. For the Pyrrhonians and the academics, the criterion should give us access to the truth of things, to their intimate nature, and not only to their appearance, to the way they appear to us. Because as far as appearances are concerned, for the Pyrrhonians as well as for the academics, well, appearances were always certain. Um, 
And there was no need of a criterion. Because sensation is reliable in itself. Because things appear the way they appear to us. But it does not say anything about what they are in reality. But appearances, insofar as they are subjective impression, in which you cannot distinguish between what belongs to the object and what belongs to the perceiving subject, well, OK, this is what I perceive when I see the photographer, this is flash. I see a flash. OK, this is for sure. But what we're interested in when we uh, are, uh, what they are interested in, is precisely to find the truth. So to find, let's say, the physical cause of this flash of lightning coming into my eyes at the moment. And so, for appearances, you don't need a criterion, because appearances just refer to themselves. They don't refer to anything else. But the principle of a criterion, precisely, is to refer something to something else. So, an appearance to a thing, what a thing is in reality. So, from that point of view, sensation cannot be a criterion for the Pyrrhonians or for the academics. It cannot be a criterion of truth. Because also for the academics, we cannot reach truth. So, no criterion of truth. And now, what's interesting is to understand how Gassandi, after having explained uh, all these different trends in the history of Greek philosophy tried to um, open his own way in uh, philosophy. And he does that in a, by using a kind of syncretism, let's say, of doctrines, which um, is intended to overcome the difficulties specific to each type of uh, the philosophy also, also uh, of this dogmatics as uh, of the and Gassendi presents his own philosophy as what he calls a via media, a middle way between the dogmatics and the skeptics. So, between the dogmatics who accepted a criterion of truth and the skeptics who rejected such a criterion. And Gassendi, this middle way for him is that he accepts the criterion of truth, but just accept the criterion of truth is dogmatic. Okay, that's so, all. No. He accepts a double criterion of truth. Not one thing. So you need two things to reach truth. Which makes it immediately more complicated, more difficult, less straightforward. And for that reason, because he accepts a double criterion of truth, I'm going to tell you just in a while what it is. I think it's problematic to call his philosophy mitigated skepticism, as Popkin did. Because, I'm sorry, this is no skepticism. Skeptics just rejected the criterion of truth. Yes, on the Syntagma Philosophicum explicitly says there is a criterion of truth. There are even two criteria. So, but it's not that you have two possibilities. It's not that it's even better. No, you don't have more choices. Now you have to join the two together to forge one criterion. So it's, it's twofold, but uh, you need two parts to, to build it. Um, and so this double um, criterion, what it is, I, I quote this Sunday. Accordingly, the result is that we may distinguish two criteria in ourselves. One by which we perceive the sign, namely the senses. So the sign is actually the appearances of things, but which are interpreted as sign, and the second by which we understand something hidden by means of reasoning, namely the mind, intellect, or reason. So basically, this twofold criterion, this is sens sensation on one, hand, on one hand, and reason or intellect on the other hand. And you have to make the two work together if you want to reach truth. So, the appearances for Gassandi, they are certain in themselves. Well, we're going to see it's a bit more complicated than that, but let's start with that. And there are signs 
from which it's possible to infer the causes of phenomena. But, um, I think this is important, Gessany remained rather cautious about how far-reaching his criteria of truth might be, and in particular in the realm of the physical sciences, where, as we shall see, many of the explanations that Gessany elaborated would remain only probable. So he says, okay, we have this twofold criterion of truth, but beware, uh, don't expect to uh, reach the, the inner nature of things all the time, and in particular in physics, it's going to be a bit difficult. And <coughs> there are many reasons why it's going to be difficult. Uh, and now I turn to how Gassani integrated this uh, academic probabilism into um, his uh, epistemology and into uh, his uh, natural philosophy. Um, first, um, as we have already seen uh, through the reading that Sonny made of academic philosophy in a historical perspective, so what drew much of his attention were the notions of probable very similar that uh, were so central to academic philosophy. And Gessany must have acquired deep knowledge of academic philosophy through the humanist training that he began in the 1620s, during which he read Cicero, so academic philosopher, Sextus Empiricus, okay, Pyrrhonian, but in which you find a lot of elements on academic philosophy, and Chardon, who was a more recent philosopher and very much uh, influenced also by academic philosophy. And this knowledge, so in the 1620s, when he was still quite young, not even 30 years old, um, was certainly crucial to the development of his anti aristotelianism so it must be acknowledged that from a chronological point of view, Gessani's interest in academic philosophy was first prompted by his humanist education. I think that's really um, the first element, his first readings in the 1620s. And as has been underlined by several scholars, um, this humanist tradition gave a weighty place to rhetoric in which the category of probable was crucial. Um, the possibility to apply this category to natural philosophy emerged then gradually, together with experience becoming more and more valued in comparison with pure logic. And so the frontier between scientific knowledge, so in the Aristotelian sense of the world, knowledge through uh, the causes, necessary, uh, necessary knowledge, and probable opinion, this frontier um, blurred, um, and there what happened was a kind of transfer of this notion of probable from the realm of rhetoric and moral to uh, the realm of natural philosophy. There is another source which is very important for uh, Gassani also in his uh, formation as a philosopher, a natural philosopher. Uh, this is um, the practices and epistemology of some scientific disciplines, so mainly two, um, meteorology and astronomy. Uh, because Gessany was the practitioner of these two disciplines. I think astronomy, you know what it refers to, meteorology, you might have some opinions, but not really corresponding to what it meant in the 17th century. So it's not just about uh, weather forecast. Um, meteorology, actually, this was based on Aristotle's meteorology camp, which dealt mainly uh, with the study of all the phenomena occurring between the moon and the surface of the earth. So phenomena like rainbows, snow, winds, lightning, all this kind of things. And precisely because that happened in the sublunar realm, this was considered to be um, really like irregular, episodic, whereas what happened in the uh, above the moon was considered to be necessarily regular was the celestial motion. So the difference between these two spheres in the Aristotelian um, natural philosophy and just also kind of a divide between two epistemological standards. Um, and Gassani was uh, an observer of this kind of meteorological phenomenon very early on. And we have a kind of record of all the observations he made. So, And he was also familiar with the fact that Aristotle considered that 
what happened between the moon and the surface of the Earth was not considered to happen uh, in a necessary way. Um, the second domain, so, is astronomy. Why is it important? Because probabilism um, was also a widespread epistemological position in astronomy. And indeed, as early as antiquity, astronomers had tried to construct explanatory cosmological models to account for their diverse observations. So they see the, the position of uh, the stars, and from this position, they try to uh, build some mathematical models that could explain the motion. But these models did not have the certainty of a demonstration because they were precisely precisely based on observations of remote objects and try to link them with a more or less coherent mathematical system. Now, of course, there could be several possible calculi uh, which could fit the observations and different explanations that could account as well for the same phenomena. And so that's the reason why they were considered to be uh, hypothetical. And what's interesting is that there is a change in Gaston's attitude toward the status of astronomical um, theories. What do I mean? I mean that in the 1620s, when you have a look at his correspondence with Perez, who was his patron, but also with Galileo, Gaston clearly expressed that he was Copernican and there was, it was clear for him this was how the world uh, worked. So a heliocentric uh, theory. But, as you know, 1633, Galileo got condemned, and, well, this had quite a bit of impact on some <coughs> natural philosophers, some trying to ignore the condemnation, uh, some try to find a way around that small as Descartes' uh, way to deal with that, but, yes, suddenly he was really impacted by that condemnation, and, um, Actually, what happened is that he changed his views. He was first a heliocentric Copernican. After 1633, he becomes all of a sudden a supporter of the Cobrite system. So you see, this is this hybrid system. You have the Earth at the center of the world. The sun revolves around the Earth and all the other planets around the sun. This is a kind of hybrid. Um, and this is this was this could be accepted by the church. Um, but so when he changes his mind, he also changes his uh, epistemological standards on the status of astronomical explanations. Because what you find in the Syntagma Philosophicum is that he states that even if the heliocentric system has some probability, he accepts the decision of the church on that matter, that's explicit in the Syntagma Philosophicum, and he says that he considers the Tychonic hypothesis as the most probable, and here the probable comes back, and the most apt to save the phenomena. You probably know the work by Duhem, by Pierre Duhem on saving the phenomena, so in this 20th century French philosophy of science, actually you already find the expression uh, but very early on, but explicitly in Gesson talks uh, in the Syntagma Philosophical of saving um, the, well, in the Institutio Astronomica first, and then in the Syntagma Philosophical uh, for those who are interested in the lectures give them later. Um, so Gesson ended by saying that it was no more possible to prove that the Earth was stationary than it was moved. And I think this is very telling that, well, to the best of my knowledge, I've really tried to have a look at all the available material, but to the best of my knowledge, no mention was made by Gassendi of the hypothesis of the astronomers as being uh, fictional or hypothetical before 1633. I've looked at the correspondence, at the works, I couldn't find anything saying that um, astronomical explanations should be considered as fictions or hypotheses. And after 1673, yes, you find them. And what is more is that he extended um, this uh, status of astronomical phenomena to other realms of natural philosophy by means of comparison. So, for example, uh, in 1646, in his uh, book 
called the Decoportione, he drew a parallel between the status of his explanations on falling bodies and the hypothesis of astronomy. But what is to be noticed also is that we have to be cautious about this extension of this model of astronomical hypothesis to other uh, realms of natural philosophy because, well, mathematical models um, were considered as mere hypothesis of fictions in ancient astronomy. But I think that the extension of probability outside this restrictive realm of astronomy to the whole of physics that Gassandi initiated actually even before 1633 also mean that probability came to be seen more as an approximation to reality than an, as a mere uh, mathematical model. And the fact that an explanation had to be tested by experience could ascertain in a certain, uh, to a certain extent that it was not a pure fiction. And this is where um, this notion of science of appearances comes into play. Um, and what is important, again, with my uh, intent to try to um, see the unity, so to say, as far as it's possible, of Gassandi's philosophy from his early works to his posthumous work, it's important to see that he developed this notion of what he calls a science of appearances, what he calls also a kind of knowledge that is experimental and based on the appearances of things as early as his first work, The Existations. And a little bit further in that book, he adds, it may well be that the basis for science does exist, but for an experimental science, and I may say a science of appearances, for our intellect has knowledge of course science by experimenting on numerous appearances. And I think this is a kind of program that would be uh, realized in the later Sintama philosophy. So contrary to the Pyrrhonians, Gassani considered that it was possible to extend knowledge beyond appearances to attempt to know their causes. But in so doing, Gassani was once again an heir to academic philosophy because he did not consider that one had to rely on appearances per se. So remember I told you, yeah, he considers that appearances are true. Well, yes, but he, actually his notion of experimental knowledge or experimentation, actually the word in Latin is experimentatio experimentalis. So of course as a problem of translation, if we translate it in English by experimental, it might convey meaning which is a bit too modern, but still I prefer to stick as much as I can to the Latin and convey the ambiguity of the meaning and try to see in Gassani's works if it fits or not. That's how I try to uh, proceed. And so this notion of experimentation, actually I think this is very much in the line of the academic notion of inspected or scrutinized appearances. Um, this corresponds to very complicated words in Greek, and I'm sure you're not interested in knowing that if you are just let me know. Um, and what does that mean? That means that for Gessandi, appearances could be envisaged from two different vantage points, inducing two different levels of epistemic certainty. You have the first level, which is appearances considered as how the object appears to the percipient. And these are always perfectly certain. Okay. The second level is appearances as they are, we try to relate them to the external object. That is to say, as playing the role of a criterion to discover the remember the twofold criteria. And this, precisely as far as we try to refer these appearances to an object which would be the cause of those appearances, they can enter into a process of, I would say, stabilization. Um, and I'm going to explain what this means. Because in the Sintama Philosophicum, Gessandi uh, was more explicit on that program. And it's consisted in making the appearances vary in order to remove all possible obstacles. So for example, you have obstacles linked to distance, to the motion of the thing you want to uh, study, or to the medium between you and the object, and this you can make them vary. 
to try to have different appearances on the same object. And then you compare the appearances and um, try to uh, find what should be, well, the one closer to uh, what the object is. And through this process, through design, it's possible to ascribe certain properties to things and rescue sensible experience as related to objectivity from radical doubt. Now, what um, distinguished uh, Carnegie's philosophy from Pyrrhonism was that Carnegie saw that it was possible to distinguish between more or less probable phenomena by comparing and relating them to one another from a representational point of view and draw some probable consequences about things on that basis. The phenomena were not just isolated and equivalent representation, but they could be compared, related to each other, um, in order to be referred in a more or less probable way to the reality of things. And this is precisely what Gessandi was doing as an astronomer, because he was collecting various celestial appearances of the same phenomenon at different times from different places, because he had a very impressive network of correspondence, so they could exchange some observations from different uh, observational point of view. He compared them and he tried to establish on that basis a kind of objective appearance that could be explained in terms of, of a more or less probable theory. And one example that I'm not sure I have really time to go into that is how you establish the, uh, the objective appearance size of, uh, of the sun or of the uh, planet uh, during an eclipse. So, yes, so the, I think, gave uh, to this notion of probable that he had inherited from academic philosophy an epistemological development that was crucial for his physics. Um, and even in his last work, the Sintagma Philosophicum, he remained cautious about the possibility to know with certainty the inner nature of all things, especially in physics. It was precisely difficult to overcome the main level of probability in the knowledge of natural causes because the only thing that was immediately certain was sensations conceived as mere appearances independently of their connection to an object. Now, formulating causal explanations of phenomena, and that's what you're supposed to do in physics, amounted to crossing the threshold of sensations. Admittedly, well scrutinized appearances were not accepted, but what could be inferred from them at a more general level could remain submitted to a form of relative uncertainty because it could not be ascertained by direct access to the inner nature of things that caused its phenomenal appearances. And also, because tomorrow we could make the experience of new phenomena that could not be coherent anymore with the causal mechanisms inferred in natural things on the basis of previous experiences. We'll come back to that, to the contingency of experience through time. But I first want to uh, insist on the fact that when I'm talking about probabilism in Gessandi, uh, I'm not uh, intending to mean it in a mathematical or statistical uh, way. I think this is very important. And this is also the reason why we can relate very much this notion of probable in Gessandi with uh, this notion of Pitan and probable, uh, very similar in academic philosophy. Because also in academic philosophy, did not consider probable as something statistical or mathematical. But um, this notion of probable was characteristic of a natural philosophy based on appearances, on phenomena understood as subjective events. And so probability depended very much on psychological strengths of conviction. So probabilis essentially meant convincing, persuasive, more than what is uh, likely to happen uh, in the next uh, experience. However, even if they share the psychological conception of probable, I think there's a big difference between Gassandi's notion of probable on one hand and Carnegie's uh, conception of probable on the other hand. And this is mainly due to the fact that Gessandi's assimilation of 
academic philosophy was mainly negated by Cicero. What do I mean? I mean that Carnegie's, from what we know, had certainly used probable representations as a criterion only for the conduct of life. And Gessonia acknowledged that. But Cicero precisely was the one who imported this notion of probable into the theoretical real. And in his own theory of knowledge, Gessonia followed Cicero rather than Carnegie's. And he imported the criterion of appearance from the real of ethics into that of natural philosophy. But, and this will lead me to the last part of that talk, this does not mean that Gassendi got rid of this ethical dimension of the problem when he assimilated it into his natural philosophy. Because what he did is that he merged, so to say, this ethical dimension with the practice of natural philosophy. So, um, just in order to completely, or so I hope, get rid of Bonke. Um, I just want to show some textual evidence that as early as 1621, so before Gessendi wrote and published the first, his first book, The Existations, which is supposed to be according to Bonke's Pyrrhonian book, Gessendi actually distanced himself from Pyrrhonism, and this mainly for ethical reasons, and referring to a life from day to day. Um, so hence the title of my talk. So this is this uh, letter. Still, my mind, my mind was not yet so sorry in fairness that it did not incline toward assenting to the opposite opinion because it wanted to believe it. In fact, only one thing, experience, was likely to make me a disciple of sexist empirics. Indeed, formerly, I used to strive toward that goal but now my concern is more to live entirely from day to day and never impose to me some documents signed by me. So what does this letter reveal? Okay, it does reveal that at some point, yes, he might have been attracted by Pyrrhonism. But what this letter shows is that as early as 1621, Pyrrhonism was not really a philosophical option anymore for Gesson. Because Pyrrhonism designated an ideal of wisdom that's simply possible to leave for Gesson, even if it could be useful at the theoretical level. But why was it so difficult to leave? Because Gesson's mind was always inclined toward one position preferably to the other, so it was too difficult for him to keep the balance between opinions and to keep this perfect suspension of assent. So for him, this would have involved fighting against this irrepressible tendency of the mind. And this would have involved like, some too much psychological pressure. And on the contrary, academic philosophy advocated a life from day to day. When Gessoni speaks about a life from day to day in the letter, actually, he refers to Cicero. Um, so to an academic philosophy. And a life from day to day, that amounted not to suspending one's ascent, but to giving one's assent to what appear most probable on one day and being allowed to give it to something else on the next day. And it's significant that in the same letter, Gesson he praised, among others, Cicero and Chapman, advocates of academic philosophy. And what is central here is that Cicero is precisely the one who advocated what he called a libertas philosophum, uh, freedom to philosophize. And this went for him hand in hand with his acceptance of academic philosophy. This you can see it in book five of the Tusculan Disputations, to which, so Gassendi implicitly referred in this letter to refer the Kipak, but actually the reference was made explicit in the Exercitationes Paradoxicae. Um, maybe I'll let you read the quotation, I'm not sure we have much time left, so. Um, Everything that is in italic is a quotation from Cicero. Um, so you, you charge me with signed documents, so this is a reference to, uh, I don't want to, uh, to, to uh, be uh, imprisoned by uh, documents signed by me. And
and I the end, we live from day to day, whatever I strike our mind with some probability, we say it, that we are here on the free planet. So Gaston is a projection of that. Dogmatism seems first motivated by his disappointment with the ethical dimension of Aristotelianism, which failed to compare with the ideal of life associated with philosophy by Cicero. This is very visible in the preface to the so I think the ethical dimension was what first directed Gaston towards anti-Aristotelianism and academic philosophy. Now, just before the passage quoted here, in your Exercitationes, in order to attack once more the Aristotelians who denied this libertas philosophy by enslaving themselves to the doctrine of their master, Gaston clearly associated this libertas philosophy with the adoption of probability. Um, and well, I'll let you uh, read the quote if you want. Um, I think this describes the procedure that Gaston Lee himself was to follow in the same time of philosophy. And so Gaston Lee adopted as a central philosophical motivation this libertas philosophy in a written from Cicero. And contrary to pluralism, which led to the suspension of judgment and consequently to the naturalization of this faculty. Academic philosophy relied on probabilism and therefore on provisional acceptance of the opinion that seemed most probable, with those probabilities being likely to be revised from day to day. So, of course, the idea of a life from day to day um, sounds mainly rela related to ethics. Um, but uh, I think that What's also important is to understand that um, this libertas philosophendi, uh, philosophendi um, was important for Gessandi to preserve the freedom to judge and to exercise one's faculty of judgment rather than to reach its suspension. And it was valuable because it was central to his own conception of the practitioner in natural philosophy. Because the problem with Puranism is that it could not lead to anything more than a kind of collection of diverse and ever-changing appearances, which left the nature of things out of their reach. And when it came to attempting to know natural things and to build a natural philosophy, judgments had to be formulated that could go beyond mere idiosyncratic appearances. So the suspension of assent of the Puranian was not really um, very attractive solution for someone who wants to be a natural philosopher. And this natural philosopher needed at least provisional judgments. But provisional judgments, so that, that could be revised. And insofar as Gesson proposed a fundamentally empiricist epistemology, it was crucial for the natural philosopher to be able to revise his theories with the various results he could gain from new experiences. So the true philosopher was the one who constantly sought new experiences. And this is how he describes the true philosopher in the Syntagma Philosophic. I'm very sorry for the ladies in that room, you will notice the very sexist remark on the week for me. He was also a man of his time, from that point of view, much more than me. Um, so what's important when you uh, when you had this uh, empiricist epistemology as Gesson Lee had is that well when you have when you collect an experience you see things uh, through your senses at a certain moment from a certain point of view and these appearances might change you get you might gain new experiences and this is one more reason why academic philosophy more and much more constructive role in Gessendi's theory of knowledge than periodism. Because precisely for Gessendi, one was never certain to have made a complete induction. So one's knowledge should remain open to later falsification and only a very careful and provisional induction could be employed. So the knowledge of nature became with Gessendi an open-ended and therefore historical process, something that took place in time. 
This indicates that the definition of an ideal of a true philosopher did not only refer to the way to lead a more quiet or happier life, but natural philosophy was truly conceived by Gessendi as an activity that presupposed a certain attitude, I would say, and not only the choice among some theoretical positions. The question was not only to rationally evaluate theoretical position and choose the best one, but to adopt an attitude of mind that would allow the philosopher and scientist to remain, to remain open to new facts, to collect new experimental data, to elaborate new explanations, and if needed, to call into question views that had been previously adopted. And if Gassani was eventually closer in his own philosophy to academic philosophy than to pluralism, this is because he conceived of natural philosophy as an inseparably theoretical and ethical activity. And academic philosophy offered him a model of the virtues required by some practice of natural philosophy. So let me draw a few conclusions. Um, as I said, whereas Cicero had only extended to the theoretical real what Carney uses as restraint to practice, Gassani offered a more complex and richer conception of the notion of probable. Admittedly, Gassani reproduced a Ciceronian extension, but he gave a specific philosophical and epistemological meaning to it. Rather than operating a mere transfer from one domain to the other, Gassani articulated in an original way the theoretical and practical dimension of the probable or very similar derived from the Greek notion of Piton. What is probable did not only consist in what guides us into everyday life, but defined for Gassani the epistemic status of explanations in natural philosophy, as well as a philosophical attitude, or scientific attitude, if you want. Instead of arousing a state of permanent worry, this ethos aimed to prepare the philosopher to the event of so far unforeseen experimental reasons. Therefore, beyond the huge but somewhat superficial use of Pyrrhonian arguments against Aristotelianism to be found in the Existationis, I think it was very crucial to re-evaluate, at the level of his old works, the impact of academic philosophy on Gessin. I think I can claim that none of Gesson's published works expressed Popkin's Pyrrhonian crisis that would carry with it the risk of fides. But as early as 1621, Gesson drew on academic philosophy as on a source that would help him define his own epistemological and ethical requirements. And in my view, this seriously undermines Popkin's interpretation, not only of Gesson as a representative of mitigated skepticism, but more generally of modern philosophy as arousing from the so-called crise pyrrhonienne. Yes, and these or Descartes' philosophical attitude should not be arraigned as, should not mainly be read, I think, as reactions to the spread of a kind of skeptical disease, but as original constructions drawing on a diversity of sources and intending to propose uh, epistemologies alternative to our expertise. Thank you. Questions? Andrew. I take it that with Hopkins sort of position, what he's interested in doing is understanding, um, he's sort of putting this, fitting in, um, this Indian to a sort of history of ideas. And I can imagine him responding by saying something like, well, I don't really care what Cassini did. What I care about is what people thought Cassini was saying, right? So, you know, the same way you might distinguish between Descartes and Cartesians, or the way that people read Descartes. So I was wondering, what did people uh, at the time, back when people cared about Cassini, think he was saying? Right. Um... As far as I can say, also when reading, for example, Gessany had much influence also through uh, Walter Charlton in the uh, um, English-speaking world, and also through Bernier, who wrote this abrégé of uh, Gessany's philosophy for the French-speaking world. And I, I, I was interested in that to see how yeah, people reacted to Gessany. Also because, I mean, you know that Picard, for example, uh, all these works have been put to the index Donald Cornegan tool, right, since 1663. 
this never happened to Gethsemane. Uh -huh. He revived Epicureanism, no less than that. But apparently everyone was very happy with him. No one was really, I, I mean, no one before René Quintard in 1943. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, I think maybe this might have been different in the 18th century, but I, I'm not really knowledgeable about that, but so I'm interested in that. But I think up to the end of the 17th century, no one, as far as I can know, has ever considered Gessandi as this kind of materialist, crypto atheist, uh, or yeah, responding to a kind of uh, Pyrrhonian crisis. But on the contrary, when you have a look at the preface Bernier wrote, Adrige insists on the fact that no, no, Gessandi was was not a skeptic. No, no, uh, and he also refers uh, to what he said. No, Gessandi was really interested in what was most probable. So, and I think this also had an impact. Uh, I think this this all, this is also important to understand. In addition to the uh, empirist dimension of his epistemology, why he was so well received in, let's call it, England. Um, so as far as I can judge, but I'm not going to tell you that I've read everything up to the, uh, the end of the 17th century, I don't think there is any textual basis of evidence in favor of Hopkins, really. Uh, I don't think so. Unless, but yes, so when I know yeah, that. Can I add something? Yeah. That, uh, one place to look definitely is uh, Joseph Blanket. Mm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And if you practically tell the story that like you were telling, yeah. he, he, he uh, groups the send in a number of people and they develop academic skepticism explicitly okay. and contrasts with the with brain. It is one way to end up with this. Yeah. Okay, this is very interesting. Uh, Okay, this is my reading. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm That's very true. happy. So, okay, Glanville plus Bernier. Okay, these are yeah, two yeah. at least. But if anyone has any evidence of, yeah, of Cassandi being a Pyrrhonian and <gasps> help, uh, I, I've, I've never found any. He was not seen as, uh, as a radical philosopher. This might, I, I must say that I find this a bit surprising. Also, when I read some passages of Cassandi. And he deals with the, the animal soul and the human soul, and really, at some time, I really wonder how people did not see something very dangerous in that. But apparently, no. Uh, so I think also from the point of view of the history of ideas, I'm not sure that Hopkins' reconstruction can stand. Mm -hmm. I'm the very trouble with Hopkins, as you said, is that he talks about the Christian. Yeah, but mm -hmm. the way he described that um, mitigated skepticism mm -hmm. is actually thinking of academic Exactly, exactly. It's your own consistency in his own. Exactly, that, that, that was a part of yeah. my point, yeah. indeed. And, but, and this is due to the fact that, of course, he connects the re religious crisis arousing from uh, Protestant Reformation to uh, what happened was at the same time, namely the rediscovery of Sextus and Pericus works. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, at one point in time, you have two events, and so Hopkins tries to connect them because, yeah, of course, that happened at the same time. But um, I'm, I'm very doubtful about this connection. This is a, just a temporal connection. I, I don't see uh, any causal connection. I mean, at least as far as the sun is concerned, maybe if we go to Montaigne, it, it, it becomes more complicated. I admit that. But Montaigne didn't provide uh, an epistemology and a natural philosophy as Gassandi does, so that's why I'm interested in that. Because, of course, this notion of probabilism, it's important also maybe for the development, I think, of this experimental philosophy. So, if, and that's the reason, I think, or the underground reason why Gassandi is so important in Hopkins reconstruction. But if you focus on probabilism and you say that it arose from a reaction to the Chris Pironian and uh, to um, uh, skeptical Judaism. No, I don't. I don't think it works actually. But this is Hopkins thesis to say more. Well, I don't think he ever says it like that. But I had the impression that his idea is: look what you take for so modern this notion of 
probabilism, experimentalism, and well, that could be connected to the Royal Society. Well, actually, it, it comes from something which is of a religious nature and a reaction to that. Um, I think that's really the point he wants to make, but no, uh, no, it's, 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 and it's very biased because, I mean, for that talk, I've only insisted on academic philosophy, but you've heard that told me, of, yeah, well, a lot of journalism, also in your reconstruction, but guess what, he drew a lot of sources as mass and deep. All these philosophers, they were not obsessed by one trend in philosophy. They, they could read everything, much more than we do, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to sort of understand um, what Gassendi's probabilism mm -hmm. amounts to. I mean, it seems like it seems like there's sort of two different ways we might be going. I'm not quite sure which one it is. Is, is probabilism something that kind of tracks truth, or is it kind of leading towards truthiness, or is it telling us what to, is it telling you what to believe more? It looks okay. like it's not both. It sort of seems like his decision, his preference for the Tychonian system, it looks like it's more about belief, about mm -hmm. um, kind of, um, this gives us sort of a fairly good explanation for the appearances of things, and it kind of fits with our religious beliefs or whatever, so it's kind of, it's, and that doesn't seem to um, contrast very well with, say, certainty, if that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I see your point, especially on the uh, system. Uh, well, I, I'm not very familiar with Guess and his ethics, but he does have an ethics. That the last part of his attack on Philosophicum, that's basically an ethics of freedom, um, a Christianized, Christianized version of Ethics based uh, on pleasure, but pleasure, you know, seems well, leading to virtue. Sorry, the life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and leading to virtue, and uh, um, so, uh, but so uh, I would say that this probabilism might play a role at, at, at what I would call a purely ethical level because it of his insistence on, f on freedom and this probabilism goes hand in hand with the fact that we shouldn't uh, bind ourselves to you know, documents signed by us, but we should uh, be given the possibility to also adapt our action from uh, yeah, when circumstances change. Um, so this is, let's say, the purely ethical level. There is an intermediate level, which is a kind of mixed uh, between uh, uh, well, natural philosophy and religious belief, and what I would call, uh, yeah, probability as uh, a way leading to truth. And what is interesting, for example, uh, I think th this works at the true extreme level. I have to think about intermediate level, so that's the reason why I keep it for uh, the last part of my report. Uh, but what's in interesting is that you, so you have the, the Greek word pitano. So which one meant um, probable, and which was translated by Cicero by um, very similis. So very similis means which it looks like truth. So if it looks like truth, it resembles truth. So this it's sort of like plausible. Yeah, plausible. But what's also more interesting that if something looks like truth, this presupposes that you have at least a certain idea of truth that must exist. And you have something that looks like. So I think by translating Pitanum by uh, very similis, Cicero, you know, in, yeah, imprinted a kind of shift on that notion towards yeah, an interpretation of probable as meaning some, something uh, leading to the truth, coming closer and closer to the truth. And I think this is also how Gesson conceives of it, because I think it connects the, the strength of conviction at the psychological level uh, with uh, the distance to truth also. So I think this works also like that. And then remains, yeah, the mix of religious belief and um, yeah, and probable explanations. So, well, 
astronomical explanation. Well, this is the most difficult part because you never know what people really believe as far as religion, religion is concerned. So, um, yeah. To the best of my knowledge, that's the only area in which this one introduced some religious consideration in natural philosophy. But there is, of course, if you, if you include it into natural philosophy, there is also the status of the immortality of the soul, of the human soul, which he treats in the syntax of philosophy, I mean, basically he says, well, you know, the soul is immortal on religious grounds, not really on philosophical grounds. So yes, indeed, maybe the notion of probable also works at um, the level of uh, repudiating religious belief and um, rational explorations um, of nature. Mm, I'm, I'm always, I try to be cautious about that because this is very, uh, yeah, debated question. Because one could say, yeah, you, you know, there are some readings which tend to say, yeah. He wrote that only because of the pressure of the church. He didn't really believe in that. This is, you know, this kind of um, uh, art of uh, writing under the persecution. I don't know whether he says that in English. But, um, I'm always very skeptical with this kind of interpretation because uh, I'm not saying that we should always believe what writers say, but I think it's always more difficult to make texts say what exactly is the contrary from what we say with them. So it's more a hermeneutical principle uh, to say that, yes, you really believe that the church was right. So he said, OK, there must be something wrong with the heliocentric system. And uh, yeah, let's go back to another hypothesis, which might work very well, also because Tico Brahe was a great um, uh, observer. So, yeah, to a certain extent, this, this system worked well so for astronomers. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very short thing here, and then we go, isn't it? One possible problem for getting into the physics is here, isn't it? Perhaps with the fact that we have to think much more than meaning and much more than the, the term probable, using the theory of probability, when what you are describing is more like provisional knowledge? Um, yeah, if you want. I, I have no problem yet. Well, I have. What? Yeah, I, I, I've used also the expression provisional yes, knowledge. And again, I, I don't mean by probable statistical, statistically likely to happen. But still, I think it's an important notion also for the 17th century because precisely Gassendi was seen as the alternative to Descartes and his certainty and clarity and distinction and uh, yes, of course, we know uh, how the world is and I have laws of nature and they are true and I can deduce uh, things from my innate ideas in my mind. Okay, this is a bit of a caricature and so I took my poor Descartes. But um, I think really that people in the 17th century also uh, saw the opposition between Descartes and Gessen that way, and that, and they saw really Gessendi as the cautious philosopher, and really as this notion of probable as central for his epistemology, and uh, this, I think, was really seen as an alternative to Descartes' dogmatism. So I think we don't put too much emphasis on it, as long as we don't interpret it, as long as we don't interpret it. Uh, as statistical, but okay, provisional, and there is a kind of strength of conviction when you interpret appearances, make them vary, interpret them as sign, and try to connect them to causes in nature. I think this is an interesting way of proceeding, uh, which was also perceived as such in the 17th century. But indeed, we have to, to, yeah, to be cautious about the way uh, we interpret it. Maybe, yeah, the title is probabilism. Maybe promised you too much, and <laughs> you expected something else. And no, I'm just telling you that he has more or less the same notion of probable uh, as uh, 
the Cicero, but he did something else with it by inserting it into his natural philosophy. Uh, yeah, it was Because first, Hawking has this idea that yes, there was there were two moments in guess in this development development of this philosophy. That first he was a Chironian, and then he was this mitigated skeptic. And what I wanted to show is that no, wrong. Right from the start, he was much more influenced by this notion of uh, probable coming from academic philosophy than from Pyrrhonism. So that my first disagreement was Hawking. And the second one is, because I refuse to split Gessen into these two parts, I cannot agree with this reconstruction of, first, you have the Pyrrhonian crisis. So that Gessen, well, honestly, when you read Gessen, you can see that he had not many existential uh, works. That was not really, he was not a Heideggerian, I don't know, no, no, uh, Angoise, no, no. <coughs> this was not, so, my, my, my deeper maybe disagreement with Hawking, uh, not only on how to read Gassendi from a chronological point of view, but more uh, deeply for the history of 17th century philosophy, is that I am myself uh, skeptical about the impact of what, of this reconstruction, what I consider to be this reconstruction of, by Hawking of this Pyrrhonian crisis. I'm not saying that some people were not really troubled by the Protestant Reformation and its implication for um, uh, the criterion for faith and uh, this kind of thing. And obviously, uh, the Catholic uh, Counter Reformation had to deal with that. But as far as philosophers, natural philosophers were concerned, I don't really see Gassendi nor do I see Mersenne or Descartes as being personally worried by a kind of spreading uh, Judaism skepticism and reacting to it. So for Gaston, that would be, uh, okay, uh, we, don't, we cannot know anything, sex to some is right, what can I do that's awful? Oh yes, I have an idea, mitigated skepticism. Mm -hmm. For Mersenne, the picture would be a bit different, so that would be you know, the advocate of the counter-Catholic counter-reformation of, oh, this is awful, everyone is going to become an atheist, we have to, you know, take the banner and <laughs> try to propose them a philosophy so that they abandon this uh, skepticism. Um, well, maybe that's a bit more true in the, this caricature in the case of Mersenne, but I think what's lacking in Hawking's uh, reconstruction is um, how you philosophically build what he considered to be a reaction. Because it's, it's one thing to say, this is this skeptical crisis spreading like a disease and you know inducing panic, we have to react. And this is the reaction that were produced. But philosophers do not only emotionally react even to skeptical arguments. I'm not saying that when the great philosophers build their philosophies, uh, they do that on the basis of rational arguments and on what they find more convincing, closer to the truth. And that's my deeper disagreement with talking. This is totally lacking in its reconstruction. How did Marcel or Gassendi came to propose this specific type of philosophy? It's not only a reaction of fear. That's something else. And that's what I think as historians of philosophy or even more broadly as historians of ideas we are interested in trying to, to analyze. Is, is it fair in my disagreement with Falcon? For Falcon. Who is the science of appearances compatible with that? 
Very good question. And very good I question. think there is a book about this problem. Uh, well, yes, the book by Sally Fisher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Atomism for Empiricists. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, th yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, but you have to consider, and that's also one dimension by which uh, Gassandi, again, did not adopt such and such philosophy uh, as it were, but really took some elements coming from before philosophical tradition and tried to integrate them into his own system. Uh, I explain what I mean. When we say that Gassandi is an atomist, he's not an atomist in the sense uh, of the pictures of or Lucretius. Why? Because um, the atomist, well, let's call it ontology, but I'm sure Gaston would not like that term. Um, for him, atomism was only the most probable matter of theory. No more than that. Even when he was, he claimed that there are atoms uh, in bodies, that the world was instituted uh, of atoms, he did not mean. He did not mean that. This was something he could demonstrate. Mm -hmm. There were different hypotheses. The Aristotelian theory of matter and form, um, Descartes' theory of um, matter as being only extension, uh, the atomic theory, the world is composed of uh, atoms and void. And what he does is that he confronts these different matter theories with some uh, experimental evidence or experiential evidence. And for him, for example, why? Do we have to recognize the existence of atoms and the void? The void we needed to account for the possibility of motion. And atoms we needed because from a philosoph from a physical point of view, it's we um, get into um, uh, dead ends if we try to account uh, for a physical phenomena on the basis of a matter that would be perfectly continuous and uh, made of indefinitely divisible. So, but again, atoms is just the most probable matter theory, and uh, we cannot see atoms, of course. But for Gessendi, the science of appearance does not mean that we just stick to what we see, but we try to connect what we see to that causes. But that the causes we don't have access access to them by our senses. But considering appearances as signs of causes, this is actually what it means by the science of appearances. Well, I think we can apply that procedure to uh, the way it consists of atoms. And you know, he also has one example that he takes, and I think this is a very common one. We can infer the existence of pores on the skin by the presence of uh, sweat. So in that example, I'm not saying that you can infer the existence of atoms exactly in that way, but you see something visible and you can account for it only if you assume that there is uh, there are this invisible force. So, and you can do the same for other physical phenomena. But again, this is just probable too, the atom. his motive from going from the uh, uh, heliocentric mm -hmm. uh, worldview to the um, that chiasm, uh, not chiasm, yeah, the uh, Hebrew uh, solution. Yeah. Uh, did he argument his move, first of all? Mm -hmm. Second of all, was his arguments his? Or uh, did someone persuade him? He's, okay, I uh, believe this because that, 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 yeah. because X told me that or okay yeah in, in which part of the life and uh, maybe in which circumstance in that era what happened yeah okay uh, yeah that's interesting uh, yeah so um, so as I said uh, there is this uh, uh, um, date of 1633 Galileo's condemnation and we, we have traces of the fact that he is aware of that through correspondence so it's in form of Galileo's uh, in his correspondence, the, the, the news was spread everywhere in Europe, so everyone knew about it. And uh, so, and so, uh, if I remember well, the dates of the letters, um, it's um, 1625. He wrote, he writes in 
writes to Galileo uh, to tell him uh, how he lost his system and his Copernican theory and his human spaces that is cosmology. So I, I'm not sure there is uh, a later element. And then uh, later on, so I said there was uh, the Instituto Astronomica, uh, which was from the 1640s. That's 42, 44, I can find it. Um, so I'm, you see, uh, from the textual evidence we have, we see that there was a position up to the 1620s and another starting with the 1640s as being made explicit. And, uh, and so this is one first thing that corroborates the importance of the ideas of information. And uh, as far as I know, uh, but I'm not entirely sure about it, I don't remember any letter, for example, in which he would tell his correspondent, uh, oh yes, that's terrible, Galileo has been condemned, I have to change my uh, cosmology, um, or, uh, or that could be also, but why? I don't understand why these people in the church decided to, to condemn Galileo for his cosmology, that's none of their business, that would be another, another option. Um, I have not to find anything like that. And in the Syntagma Philosophicum, so the very last work of um, Gassani, uh, the only thing he explicitly says is the church said that the heli heliocentric system is not accepted. So this he mentions it explicitly. Uh, and we say, okay, if the church says it, I have to recognize that this is not an option, even if he, he explains. You know, the heliocentric uh, hypothesis, he describes it, so that would amount to blah, blah, blah. Uh, But then he says, well, since the church says it's not an option for a true Catholic, uh, I have to find something else. And on that account, um, the Teconic hypothesis seems to me the most probable one. So maybe this is an official statement, but not. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's the whole problem. Is this what, he, I mean, was it sincere or not? Uh, is it purely declarative to protect himself? Or another option that we should have excluded, he was a sincere Catholic, and for him, the opinion of the church mattered. We should not exclude that. Of course, from our point of view, this seems to be, no, this, is this seems weird. <laughs> Because we, we would not accept, well, there's still some debates going on about evolution and these things like that. Uh, but more and more for us, this is difficult to accept that we should uh, comply with the church statements on what no. is considered to, be, to belong to science. Uh, but in the 17th century, of course, uh, we shouldn't think that they reacted in the same way as we do now. So He wanted to leave. Sorry? <laughs> He wanted to live, or not live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, <coughs> uh, well, Galileo was not condemned to death. Yeah. Galileo did live. I mean, it was just, he was asked to stay at his home, and uh, uh, well, he was in prison at the point, but, um, yeah, um, I don't, yeah, and, well, yeah, Jordan uh, Bruno had went to the same. Vanini was also condemned to the state here at the beginning of the 17th century. So, yeah, some people lost their lives. But, um, well, I'm not sure that, you know, it could have said, well, we have three types of uh, hypothesis, and well, um, the heliocentric position has some probability. Because what was reproached to get somebody is just to say, no, it's not how probable it is. So he could have done that, but he went further than that. He went further than that. I cannot read into Gassendi's religious uh, convictions, but he went further than that. He went further than Descartes, for example, on that issue. Descartes tried to find a way to keep his other centric system, but just rhetorically reformulated it to say, no, no, that year he was stationary, and, uh, uh, but basically didn't change anything to his cosmology. 
change the way he presented it uh, by interpreting motion in a safe way. Terms. Yeah, it was it was safe too. Um, but guess what? It maybe was yeah. It did, maybe it didn't need to go that far, but it did. <coughs> Thank you very much, Delphine, for this talk. Um, I have a question uh, about the link between certainty and probabilism. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would go uh, somehow in the direction uh, sketched by uh, Kirsten earlier and a bit on uh, the comment we received from Dana. Uh, so, uh, isn't it possible to uh, integrate probabilism within this uh, tripartite distinction uh, of certainty? This uh, distinction that comes from uh, the late scholastics between uh, morally certain, physically certain, and uh, metaphysically or absolutely uh, certain. Uh, a distinction which Descartes transforms into uh, a sort of uh, twofold distinction mm -hmm. between uh, morally certain and uh, metaphysically certain. Yeah. But still, he discusses about uh, mm, the possibility of uh, mm, uh, reaching a knowledge that is more than morally certain. Uh, the probabilism and uh, mm, this attempt to uh, mm, reach provisional knowledge mm -hmm. would seem to be uh, mm, the type of uh, more than moral uh, certain that Descartes is uh, talking about. Okay, um, I wouldn't uh, go that way for two reasons, but I mean, uh, just we can discuss about that. I have no, no certainty on that. Um, but, well, the first point is that, but, I know what you're going to reply to me immediately, but, um, well, maybe Gessini was even more anti-Aristotelian uh, than Descartes. Um, and uh, as far as I know Gessini, I haven't read everything, but I have a tendency to think that um, Gessini took up much less scholastic materials than Descartes did. Uh, of course, Descartes transformed it and reintegrated it into a completely different philosophical system. Uh, but maybe this would have been more different, more difficult for Gessandi to, uh, to reintegrate this scholastic material. He, he, he hated it, really. I mean, for him, that was much more than Descartes, I, I think. Uh, you see, close for the language now. <laughs> and you were saying philosophers are not emotional. <laughs> so love and hate is equal to spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. we got this. Uh, this is very funny because, yeah, that, you, that's a good point. There is the exaltation is paradoxical. It's terrible how much hate there is in that book because they are studious. Hostility. Yeah, hostility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing personal, of course. Yeah. Just not the level of what you read. But um, this is a very, uh, yeah, very energetic, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, so, yeah, that would be my, my first reservation. Uh, of course, this, uh, this does not rule out completely uh, your point, because even if it's very much into IFRS to kill it could do the same thing as Descartes. The second um, reason why I have some reservation about that possibility, but again, I'm not perfectly sure about it, is that, as far as I understand it, Descartes' moral certainty is very, very certain. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes very far in the direction of certainty, uh, because the example he gives of the code, and I don't think that Gessner's notion of probable even goes, uh, even goes as far as Descartes' moral certainty. That would be uh, my reservation. But of course, he could have uh, reinterpret the scholastic uh, divisions and try to do with the moral certainty something closer to his notion of the problem. Indeed, that would be it. And give it less, much weight than, uh, epistemic weight, I mean, than Descartes. That could be it. But, yeah, probable is not as certain as morally certain, I think. It, it's, yeah, it, it, it sets a direction, but, uh, yeah. It wasn't much more modest than this. I think Adrian, this 
Um, this is a, I don't understand, perennialism question. So, I'm trying to, so I take it, the skepticism of the peronium is something about either um, whether there is an account of certainty or whether we can even conceive of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's supposed to be some connection between that and claims about kind of provisional knowledge or something like that. So, or are they silent on that? Uh, does, well, does the peronium, so, so the you said we talk applied that the peronium thinks that we don't even get provisional the knowledge. Is, is peronium say the probable, the probable for, uh, does not come into play in the peronium account. The probable is really something the academics were concerned with. Because the, what the peronians want, want to achieve is certain truth. Truth that is certain. And for them there's only on one hand certain truth and all the rest that you have to doubt. So there is no real middle ground. They are, no, they are not interested in, in a possible middle ground. And what they say is that we don't know whether we could achieve certain truth, but there are a number of things about which we have no certainty. Um, and there is nothing that is more probable than something else. So we have to suspend our assent about all these things and go on searching, trying to reach truth that we can. We don't even have any idea whether we will reach it. So the first half of what you said yeah. sounded like it could hear the probabilism, where you say something like, it just turns out that these guys don't care about it. But ah. then the second thing of what you said sounded like a denial probabilism, which said, no, 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 we until yeah. basically we should truth. stop this epistemic, like this middling truth. epistemic business until we actually get to the truth, damn it, otherwise yeah. we don't care. Yeah, that's a very good point indeed. Um, yeah. Um, actually, I, I think that um, when they say, I think it's okay, they reject the notion of probable in um, their epistemological assessment of opinions. Uh, precisely because for them everything is equal, equipolent, that they, you know, one appearance, another appearance. We cannot make any distinction in terms of uh, truth value. So for that reason, there is no hierarchy, in a sense, as far as truth is concerned. So there, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, no. so could one way point of view to be, because I was trying to reconstruct various yeah. ways that this might work, one might be something like, so if you think about, say, the similitude, then well, in order to know that you've got the similitude, you have to know what it would be for yeah. it to, in fact, be true. Yeah. And you don't want to be certain. You don't know what it would be to be certain, so you have no grounds on which you can actually compare things. So, yeah. is it, so it's got this kind of foundationalism built into it, where yeah, yeah, in order yeah. to say anything, you have to be able to... So is that sort of the way it's supposed to work? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just one thing, just remember that we're talking only about the theoretical level. So, uh, because also for the Pyrrhonian, they say, yeah, okay, but for, for life, we just have to, uh, you know, to uh, comply with the customs of the country. Uh, yeah, well, that's the ethical part. I'm not really interested in that, and that is purely ethical part. Uh, but, yeah, indeed, there, there, yeah, uh, there are some, yeah, deep, uh, yeah, from traditionalists, as you call them, um, uh, problem. Um, and this is, this is kind of... Um, uh, is, so is it something like an underdetermination? Because, so for instance, are there things that we know are false, right? Like, so, uh, surely, um, can I know false things? Can I, can I know negative truths? Um, yeah. For example, that uh, this is not the case that... I'm not, I'm not currently experiencing a pink elephant. You're not currently experiencing... A pink elephant. Um, or any yes, kind of Yes, because elephant. this relates only to your subjective uh, perceptions. Uh -huh. So you can, for the Pyrrhonians, you can say, I see uh, a uh, blue uh, glass. Mm -hmm. But you, by saying I see a blue glass, you don't mean that there is a blue glass, that, or that the glass is blue, or uh, something like that. But the Pyrrhonians say that our appearances are true, qua appearances, qua subjective. So, yeah, I see a 
Yeah, I see a lot of uh, I see, uh, I don't know whether I can say I see that much of it. This is going too far <laughs> in terms of interpreting my um, appearances. But appearances are certain for appearance. The problem is when you try to infer something about things from appearances. And precisely because all your appearances have um, the same right to truth, or precisely no right to truth, they are ex exactly on the same level, because they are just appearances, you cannot uh, say something which would be, uh, which would have the truth of you. Uh, on, yeah, on the same time. Uh, is, is it clear? Okay. I've been saying lots of things, so we can talk <laughs> So it's not clear. We can move the discussion. <laughs> Uh, if there are no other questions, then we can move this discussion to the pub and we would like to thank the team for it. <laughs> I would like people to know that there will be a, a second talk by the team tomorrow at the Institute and there is a new seminar at the Institute tomorrow from 4 to the top from 2 and from 4 there is a seminar on sensitive models run by Adrian. So everyone who wants to come, that's at the Institute. Tomorrow. And now let's go and have a beer.